Good evening and welcome to the Stained Glass Museum's Autumn Webinar Series 2022. I'm delighted to welcome you all this evening uh, to our first talk of the series um, and it's a talk by a contemporary artist that I'm excited to tell you more about and to hear more about her work. Uh, before we introduce Pinky McClure, our artist, a few housekeeping notices. Um, you will see at the bottom of the screen or the top of your phone, if you're on a phone or iPad, that there are some functions, uh, including chat and Q&A and raise hand. Um, during this evening's talk, if you have a question for Pinky that you'd like to ask at the end, please do put it in the Q&A. If you have um, any issues, uh, please put it in the chat and myself or my colleague will try and resolve uh, if we can. Um, and then finally, an another if you have an issue, you can also use the raise hand function. So please do use those functions this evening. Uh, but thank you all for, for joining us. Without further ado, um, I will now ask Pinky to start her video and introduce our speaker for this evening. So, Pinky McClure is a multidisciplinary Scottish artist joining us from Scotland this evening. Um, there are few contemporary artists, in my opinion, taking figurative stained glass to new levels of interest, especially in terms of subject matter. And Pinky McClure is definitely one of them. Um, she makes stained glass installations and examines big issues in the themes in her work, including addiction, insomnia, and humanity's destructive relationship with nature. She brings stained glass to new audiences um, through, through her media and new art galleries that the stained glass is exhibited in. She's exhibited in Venice, in London, in Edinburgh, and New York, just to name a few places. And she's the recipient of several arts and crafts prizes. Um, most recently, actually, this year, she was the joint winner of the Sequestered Prize for Self-Portraiture with a stained glass self-portrait, which is fantastic. And she's currently working on an immersive stained glass uh, installation incorporating um, audio, visual arts and performance. So a really exciting artist um, who I know whose work has recently been acquired by the National Museums of Scotland and definitely an artist to watch. So Pinky, thank you so much for agreeing to speak to us this evening. I've seen some of the slides and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So over to you. Thank you very much, Jasmine. It's absolutely brilliant to be here. I'm, I'm so excited to have been asked to do this talk. I spend a great deal of my life doing stained glass, thinking about stained glass, making stained glass, looking at stained glass, um, so it's wonderful to be able to share my experiences and thoughts with you all. So thank you so much for coming. Having said all that, I don't actually define myself as a stained glass artist. Because despite stained glass being this incredible, powerful and beautiful art form, I think it's largely misunderstood and overlooked as a, as a form of contemporary art. Maybe this is because it's largely dependent upon architecture or because in the past, most stained glass artists were anonymous. Oh, these were great artists. It's terrible that they were overlooked and, and forgotten. Those artists were able to rise above the many, many aesthetic limitations of, of a really difficult art form. There are not many contemporary artists who make their own stained glass now, which is a great shame because for me, the best stained glass has a lively spontaneity that comes from physical contact with the paint and the glass and, and, a, and a true love of making with all its happy accidents. And that's something that's really important to me. Personally, I find the manual process and the conceptual process to be closely linked and the happy accidents are what I really love. In fact, I think it's, they're complementary, those two aspects of it. 
When I'm making my stained glass using mainly very ancient techniques, I can almost feel the presence of those early stained glass artists. It's like they're breathing down my neck, but in quite a good way. What were their lives like? What would they think if we could beam them in to our world? Would they find us absurd? I believe our present is haunted by our past in a very positive way. Before I took up stained glass, I was a recording artist for many, many years. I write my own songs, but I also adapt really old folk songs and jazz songs, working in a duo using electronics and field recordings. Songs that might not have been sung for years or decades and never, maybe never recorded. They can be given a new life through technology. I love the unexpected clash of the old and the new. It highlights the transience of life and the long threads of time. We've got so much in common with our ancestors. I enjoy all the research that's involved in that, finding the things we have in common. I'm taking a similar approach with stained glass, using an ancient art form to shed a different light on contemporary subject matter. I should be sharing my screen with you, shouldn't I? Stained glass windows were invented in the 11th century to highlight sermons and to communicate big topics such as heaven, hell and the apocalypse. Their vastness and their moralising can be overwhelming and alienating. But some of the oldest windows, which have miraculously survived over centuries, contain strange fragmented details which appear uncannily modern often displaying a poignant humour and eerily present, prescient imagery, giving us enticing glimpses of lost worlds. In the 20th century, with the arrival of abstraction and minimalism in architecture, on top of the decline in church attendances, imagery in stained glass began to vanish or be toned down, made purely decorative. Its storytelling power began to disappear. I'm excited about the possibilities of using stained glass as a storytelling tool for the 21st century, as intimate, glowing installations, telling personal and universal stories about the pressing topics of our time, such as addiction, noise pollution, women's rights, and humanity's self-destructive, abusive nature. Before I show you my own work, I'd like to see I'd like you to see one of my favourite stained glass panels. This is Sarah and Tobias's wedding night from the V&A Museum. It's quite small, just 66 centimetres tall, but the painted detail is exquisite. It was made in about 1520. Over many years of looking at old stained glass windows, I found myself reading some really colourful and extraordinary stories that I never would have encountered otherwise. At this point, I should perhaps mention I was brought up in an atheist household and the idea of reading the Old Testament was a very long way away from any hopes my parents had for me. This little panel shows an apparently idyllic domestic scene, but it's in fact a illustrating a Bible story in which Sarah's seven previous husbands had one by one been devoured by demons on the wedding night. On this happy occasion, however, Tobias was saved from the demon by following the advice of an angel and burning the entrails of a fish. Surely enough to scare anybody enough away on their wedding night. This is Landfill Tantrum, one of the first small pieces I made specifically to be in, installed in a light box. I think of these pieces as glowing paintings, 
Prior to this, I'd been making relatively conventional architectural stained glass for private customers. And I'd become very frustrated with the artistic limitations of commission-based architectural work. People might assume that all stained glass artists aspire to make the biggest, grandest work possible. And I have in fact made some pretty enormous stained glass windows. They're just lots of little ones stuck together, to be honest. But size is not everything as they say. And to me, it felt like much of the work I was making for people's houses was a bit like an upmarket neck curtain. Sometimes people even ask me to make something to match the couch, as if the couch might outlive the stained glass. I felt so depressed. I needed to do something drastic. Because after years of pandering to people who had no artistic vision, I felt overwhelmingly that stained glass should be allowed to be a contemporary art form in its own right. So after completing a big church job one year, I managed to rescue a lot of small red scraps left from the damaged windows that I had replaced. I removed them quite laboriously from their original zinc frame and started using them to make small personal pieces to be shown in light boxes. I actually used those scraps for years and years and it saved me wasting lots of expensive flashed glass as I experimented with a new approach and learned how to sandblast and engrave with a drill. Flash glass has the colour on one side only, allowing the artist to remove areas of colour by engraving, sandblasting or acid etching. You can then paint imagery onto the white surfaces. I still enjoy the random quality that using scraps of glass gives the work. It forces me to design around the shape of whatever pieces I happen to have. You'll see here, the man on the top left has a line going through his hand and his wrist. That's not what I would instinctively have designed, but it was the only size of glass I had available. So I just went with it. And then I realized I liked the effect of it looking like it was an old window that had been repaired. It seems some to me to emphasize the chaos and confusion of modern life, the disjointedness of our lives. Well, my life at least. I became very excited about the potential freedom of just doing whatever I wanted. Anyway, my original pencil sketch in this case was just an outburst of a general frustration at life. But as you might know, stained glass is really, really slow and meticulous. So once I started making the piece, as the days went by, another story gradually appeared. It became an expression of frustration about landfill, about plastic, the abuse of nature, the impossibility of disposing of rubbish with all the associated feelings of guilt and annoyance, especially the feeling that the responsibility is being passed on to the consumer when there's very little option but to buy food wrapped in single-use plastic and then dump it in the ground, releasing greenhouse gases. Then, as I worked on, another story emerged. It started to bring back memories of difficult years spent living in damp, insecure, squatted housing in London. In particular, one house I lived in where the addict neighbours used to throw their used needles out for the rest of the rubbish. The council rubbish collectors understandably refused to touch it, it being the 1980s at the height of the HIV epidemic. So these black bags of rubbish just sat outside the house for weeks, building up into a huge spiky stinking pile. In this image, abandoned tin cans, dolls, heating pipes, plastic bottles, and hypodermic needles all poke out from the grass. Hands point accusingly. The dreadful behavior of the human race is being observed by a number of appalled animals, including an ass and a cow, which are lifted directly from a medieval nativity scene. I realized that this kind of stained glass could also be a therapy for me and a way out of many, many years of frustration. 
So I tried sending images of my first pieces to various art galleries and artist membership websites, but none of them seemed to understand. I was told it wasn't contemporary art. One gallery even said they only accepted original art, as if stained glass somehow could not be original. It was frustrating. I didn't understand why painting on glass should be considered less important than painting on canvas. Then one day, I saw an open call for a craft exhibition organised by a charity called Outside In, who provide a platform for artists who face barriers to the art world. This piece was accepted for a wonderful group exhibition called Radical Craft, which toured the UK. And that's when things really began to happen for me. It was so rewarding to see people respond and relate to my internal frustrations and my dark memories expressed in stained glass. Maybe I wasn't deluding myself after all. I started to realize that stained glass could be a powerful medium for telling stories about real life instead of just Bible stories or the stories of the wealthy and the powerful. I think there's an inherent tension between the sacred and the unexpected, which gives stained glass a weight that the other art forms don't have. In this piece, Stop Go, which is actually my front door, I placed the medieval character Primavera, who represents spring, in the middle of the motorway system known as Spaghetti Junction. It rises up behind her into a yellow polluted skyline. She's challenging us to decide whether to build more roads through the countryside. She's flanked by an abandoned shopping trolley on one side and a roadside bouquet of flowers on the other in a brown scorched lamps landscape. The trees behind her are festooned with strange insects like Christmas decorations reflecting our desire for beauty at the expense of natural beauty. Below her feet, rabbits are tucked into their burrows amongst discarded plastic bottles. You can see them in the larger detail on the right. I was incredibly excited when in 2016, I was invited to make a piece for an exhibition called Art of Glass at the National Museum of Scotland and the National Centre for Craft and Design in Sleaford. I knew I wanted to make something really beautiful, but that thought immediately led me to question notions of beauty. Pow! So much to talk about there, I hardly knew where to begin. I'd been feeling particularly irritated at the time by the hijacking of the colour pink. It seemed like there were suddenly thousands of awful pink nylon fairy frocks and makeup that started to appear in the shops aimed at little girls. Inspired by the Piero della Francesco painting Madonna of Mercy, I placed a Madonna in a pink frock, topless, with her torso marked ready for plastic surgery or liposuction. Her nipples have been censored. Two little girls gaze up at her from a grey world of abandoned cosmetic bottles marked natural or eternity. She has a halo made of Botox needles and scalpels. Above her head, there's a pair of scales traditionally used in medieval art to depict the weighing of the souls. When a person's life is assessed, by weighing their soul after death in order to judge their fate. But here they're marked with the words from the long running TV advert, worth it or not worth it. A snail, apparently used in some facial beauty treatments, believe it or not, crawls up a stream of blonde hair, or is it vomit coming from a bulimic girl above her? To her left, there's an angelic looking grandmother knitting a long conveyor belt scarf of Barbie dolls. She was inspired by a woman I used to work with in a charity shop. Because she was 82, everybody used to gush and say how wonderful she was. But in fact, she was what I would call a body fascist. She used to constantly criticize the younger women in the shop for being too fat. 
It made me think about the inherited neurosis about body image that so many of us have, often passed down to us by mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers who dislike their own bodies and think they're doing us a favour by pointing out our perceived shortcomings. Of course, the beauty industry thrives on this. The detail shows a close-up of one of these weirdly thin articulated, articulated dolls. They're on a layer of sandblasted and painted glass with another layer painted like a net on top of it. Here, at the bottom, a woman is shooting a mirror to smithereens. The viewer can catch a glimpse of their own reflection in those mirror shards. There are two palm trees which represent the continuing destruction of the rainforest by cosmetic companies who use palm oil in their products. Finally, at the very top, we have a gleeful Satan with a pile of books on his back, hopping across the towers of Cambridge, stealing all the wisdom. After beauty tricks had been exhibited, I was surprised and thrilled to get lots of Instagram messages from young women and girls saying how much it had meant to them. So since 2017, I've devoted nearly all my time to making stained glass. I've got a long list of bees in my bonnet just waiting to be released. This piece is a big moan about consumerism or um, maybe an anti-fast fashion piece. It's a nostalgic tribute to the days when women used to save up all year or years to buy themselves a winter coat. And then they go shopping and meet their friends in town and have a nice cup of tea from a china cup. They're ghosts. So I painted them in sepia on a layer of float glass, floating under another two layers of glass on which I've painted steam rising from their teacups. Ghostly mist and lacy curtains gently flapping in the breeze. In contrast, the shoppers on the right are in a state of panic, desperately grabbing a bargain on Black Friday. They seem to be controlled by their carrier bags, which contain little demons, representing consumerism, overconsumption and greed. They're gleefully controlling the shoppers' minds. The red stickers say, going, going, gone. I made this panel quite a few years ago before we find ourselves in the economic crisis we're in now. Maybe we will all be saving up to buy a second hand winter coat soon. The carrier bag was made with two layers of glass and the little demons painted on the bottom layer. The background is painted with graffiti like the shutters over the empty shop front seen in high streets everywhere across the country. Here's a ghost of thrift. She's a bit reminiscent of old sepia photographs with watermarks and faded edges. They have that poignancy. I like the idea of the, the three of them sitting in a cafe with lacy curtains, with neat hair and pearl earrings, drinking their tea and tut-tutting about all the mayhem going on outside in the future. This is Pills for Ills, Ills for Pills. It's one of my favourite pieces, although the subject matter is pretty dark. Drug addiction is a complex problem that often stems from childhood circumstances, peer pressure, or just one silly decision made out of naivety. But recently, I was listening to a programme on the radio about the overuse of prescribed opioids. According to the NHS website, opioids are very good analgesics for acute pain, but there's little evidence they're helpful for, for long-term pain. Despite this, they're widely described for chronic pain. Opioid prescribing has more than doubled in recent years in the UK. It's been referred to as an opioid, opioid epidemic in the UK, similar to the USA. Simply put, opioids are highly addictive. 
And if they're taken for too long, they start to lose their effect. People have to take bigger and bigger quantities to ease the pain and the addiction soon takes hold. I saw this happen to my own mother. These two people are being plunged into that destructive cycle with a never ending conveyor belt of pills falling into their mouths. If you look carefully, a giant grinning skull can be seen in the blue background, surrounded by beautiful but deadly opium poppies. I chose red and blue for this piece to reflect the intensity of pain and addiction. I find it horrifying that opiates are so often the go-to remedy. I suffer from chronic pain myself, but I relieve it with exercise and so far I've avoided the opioids. I couldn't resist including some gorgeous opium poppies. The drips of opium milk coming from the seed heads remind me of tears and the veins and the petals relate to the dreadful subject matter too. Inspired by some windows I saw at York Minster, I put some subliminal monsters in the background. You can just about see them in the blue section top left. I haven't spoken much about technique, so here's a work in progress shot of this piece while it was on my light box. To be honest, most of the methods I use are very traditional. It's really only the sandblasting that's modern. And I use that to subtly remove the color in the flashed glass. I also use a drill for sharper, finer detail. But most of the time I'm just cutting, painting and firing, pretty much like those monks did back in the 12th century. The only difference is their fuel bills were lower. Once all the pieces are finished, I join them together with either lead or copper foil. I usually use lead for architectural pieces and copper foil for light boxes because it weighs so much less and I'm trying to keep lead use to a minimum. Well, now that I've made you all feel depressed, here's something to cheer you up. Fish and chips, or chips at least. In my endless browsing of medieval art online, one day I came across a quote from the Old Testament in which an angel descends from heaven and orders the birds to fly down and eat the humans. This immediately made me think of hysterical tabloid headlines I'd seen about people having their fish and chips stolen by seagulls. It always seems to get exaggerated into near-death scenarios with people having their pets carried off into the sky or their babies devoured. So I made a typical British seaside scene with Punch from the Punch and Judy show, a helter skelter and a chip van. Punch, that notoriously untrustworthy character, is carrying a placard with the Bible quote written on it and selling leaflets for five pounds plus VAT. And we all know there's no VAT on leaflets. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals and mighty men and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. The chip angel can be seen in her pinny, calling out from her chip van, spatula in hand. She has quite a lengthy menu. Chips, chicken, pudding, haggis, fritter, pea buster, can, but no fish. The fishing boat up to the right is trawling for fish, but its net is empty. And it's just filling up with bubbles because the seas have been overfished and are polluted. The helter skelter to the right as the words from the Beatles song of the same name floating around. Helter skelter, helter skelter, tell me the answer. Further down, there's total mayhem. This sunburnt man is ducking to escape a hungry seagull, which is trying to carry him off, chips and all. In all of this frenzy, the man's tomato ketchup is being spilt everywhere, including onto his pet chihuahua which you can just see between his legs and amongst the flowers. One of the tabloid reports I read 
claimed that a chihuahua had been swallowed whole by a hungry seagull, so it seemed appropriate to include one. On each side of the chaos, gloved hands plunge out of the ground, brandishing trowels in a rebellious display of strength, symbolising nature's resilience. I made this piece out of a lot of scraps of green glass. So there are quite a lot of lead lines in odd places, which also gives the impression that the people are caught in a net themselves. This piece is very special to me. It tells the story of a place called Portavadi, an idyllic, unspoilt corner of West Scotland. My granddad had a tiny cottage there. Every year, he and my aunt used to lock up their flat in Leith, Edinburgh, and spend the whole summer there in Portavadi. We often used to join them. There was no electricity, no running water, so it was very primitive, but we all remembered those days as the happiest of our lives. My parents even spent their honeymoon there. We used tilly lamps drew water from a well and slept on the floor under a skylight. The house was on the edge of a beautiful sandy bay, very shallow and warm in the summer. It was safe enough for small children to bathe in, and we used to regularly see basking sharks, porpoises and seals. We used to go and get fresh milk and eggs from our friends at Portavadi Farm and played with our cats and dogs. We went out line fishing for mackerel on Loch Fine in a slightly leaky rowing boat. I remember walking down to the beach with my mum at dusk when we, we used to be able to hear snipe drumming in the reed beds and ran our hands through the water to see gold phosphorescence. Even the rocks had names. We had no idea how lucky we were. As a child, you assume those special dearly loved places will be there for you forever. Then, in 1973, by order of the Department of Energy, 110 acres of Portavadi were chosen for development to provide an oil platform construction yard. At the time, construction companies, which could make a fortune from just one order for a concrete oil platform, were prowling the West Coast looking for sites, without taking too much account of what the consequences might be. 110 acres of land around my granddad's cottage were completely transformed into a construction site. And a concrete workers village was built to house hundreds of workers, costing 14 million pounds of taxpayers' money. The shallow bay we'd love to bathe in had explosives placed in it to deepen it and was turned into a dry dock. The gently sloping beach became sheer cliffs the whole area was utterly devastated. But it be quickly became apparent that there were too few orders for the type of platforms the company was proposing. And the site at Portavadi became obsolete before it was even completed. The company went bankrupt, leaving the government with an embarrassing mess to clean up. Portavadi was described in the press as the most expensive man-made hole in Europe. The site and the village were bought and sold many, many times over the next few decades, with some unscrupulous unscru people making enormous profits. The village fell derelict and was used as a gallery for graffiti artists for some years, before finally, after decades of expensive bureaucratic disputes, it was finally demolished in 2016. My piece shows me dreaming of Portavadi before and after the destruction. I'm dreaming of running through Portavadi in my summer shoes. There's a passing place sign, the concrete, concrete poles with razor wire that were erected around the house, explosions, round trees, the view of the hills from the bedroom window, and a danger keep out sign, oily water and graffiti clad concrete buildings overgrown with gorse. My parents are just above my head with their potty at the end of the bed. I felt so sad about Portavadi. I was only 12 and it was a harsh introduction to environmental destruction. Nowadays, Portavadi is known as the site of a luxury spa hotel on Marina, but few people know its history prior to that. There's very little about its history online. 
the government of the time were naturally quite keen to have it forgotten about. So I was delighted to have this piece acquired by the Nat National Museum of Scotland in 2020, which means that the story of Bart Bortavadi's fate at the hands of a corrupt, incompetent oil industry has not been completely swept under the rug after all. Here's a couple of details. On the left, you can see a decaying graffiti clad concrete building surrounded by gorse and razor wire with an explosion taking place behind it. The rusty old keep out signs remain there for decades. They may even still be there. On the right is a detail showing my parents with their potty at the end of the bed and a sadly appropriate passing place sign above their heads. The view out the bedroom window is exactly how I remember it. With the view onto the bay, the hill called Jerigrich, and the curtains covered in pink roses. Next thing you know, COVID comes along. I was very lucky to be able to keep working. As during COVID, art sales seemed to take off while people couldn't go on holiday. This piece is called The Gathering. It was made at the height of the first lockdown while the vaccine was still being developed and the, the failing track and trace app was being described by Baroness Hardman and Matt Hancock MP as the cherry on the cake. I thought this a very strange and clumsy mixed metaphor. What was the cake they were referring to? The gathering started off as an idea for a kind of ring a ring of roses reference and, and that's why it's in the shape of a rose window. But I got tired of these endless plague references and went off that idea. So it ended up just being a simple dream of a tea party with friends. Seen here politely waiting their turn for a slice of cherry tart with only the arrows and carefully the restrained hands being a subtle reference to social distancing. I enjoy using red, pink and blue glass together, especially in layers like these big flowers, for example, which seem to jump around in front of your eyes. They have an unnerving depth that's a lot more evident when you see the work in real life. In fact, it has a quite hallucinate, hallucinatory 3D quality, a bit like all part. I'm also inspired by the strange disconnected hands and heads that you quite often see in medieval and Renaissance art. This presence of disconnection and fragmentation is becoming increasingly important to me in my work. It seems so appropriate to life today. I feel it reflects our ongoing anxiety and our, our struggle to communicate and, and to reach out to one another. Life feels fragmented. There's a conflict going on here between the pleasure of a tea party and the need for self-control and restraint, a conflict I still feel when I'm out and about in crowds. During lockdown, I was lucky to have a commission to make a window for the beautiful Antobar Arts Centre in Tobermory in the Isle of Mull off the west coast of Scotland. The curator said the only brief was that it had to be about what is happening now? In a fast evolving scenario, I went through various different ideas before I settled on this one, which is simply called, I miss my mum. Not the most poetic of titles perhaps, but it was what it all eventually boiled down to, because I wasn't able to travel up to Aberdeenshire to visit my mum, who is very old and too vulnerable and spent many of the last months of her life in, in isolation. This was sadly a situation that many of us will recognize. Anyway, I returned to the intense blue and red palette of some of my previous pieces to reflect the intensity of the situation, the sense of desperation, the urgency, the hot and cold of it all. The heart shape's a bit of a cliche, but I wanted to make the piece direct and simple and everybody will recognize the heart as a symbol of love. It seemed pointless to beat around the bush under such extreme circumstances. So here we see a mother and daughter emotionally entwined, but physically far apart. 
reaching out to one another, trying to communicate using technology, but being torn apart by its limitations. The heart is surrounded by a tangle of confused cables and dozens of black and white lost keys, representing lockdown and our loss of freedom. The windows installed above one of the doors at Antoor Barn would be a permanent, poignant reminder of that. After I'd finished that commission, as COVID rolled on, I needed something else to do. So I decided to enter a self-portrait competition called the Sequestered Prize. This piece was named after a song by The Fall called Totally Wired, which is just how I felt, especially in the early days of lockdown, when I'd wake abruptly in the night and the full implications of the pandemic would hit me right between the eyes. The scribbles around my head express that scrambled feeling of confusion and panic. The little white stars engraved in the dark blue night sky are the hands of my friends and family waving goodbye to me on Zoom. My eyes are a bit crossed as I stare into middle distance through yesterday's smudged mascara. All the plants in the posy are supposed to be sedatives. St John's wort, passiflora, valerian, lavender and opium. But sadly, none of them are effective at all when you're in such a state of high stress, although I didn't actually try the opium, in case you're wondering. My nails are bitten and I haven't been able to refresh my chipped nail varnish because I can't get to the shops. Last year, I made this piece, Tree of Life and Death Scenarios. I've used trees a lot in my work. They're a potent symbol now because of deforestation and acceleration of climate change. Many people are just starting to realize that Britain was once covered in trees. And it's only since World War II that the Scottish Highlands, for example, have been reduced to a barren treeless landscape by human deforestation, resulting in a disastrous lack of biodiversity. Trees have also been used since time immemorial by many different religions and civilizations as a symbol of the life cycle. The hands and feet in this piece are symbols of this human intervention. At the bottom of the tree, people are dangling in that black and white area you can see in silhouettes, dangling from the branches, playing or maybe desperately clinging on for dear life. At the top, there's a chanterelle mushroom it's only recently that people have started to understand the significance of and the importance of fungi and its relationship to trees. It's thought that trees can communicate with each other through the invisible maze of threads of fungi that join them. It's a network called the mycelium, which connects individual trees. The mycelium deliver nutrients, sugar and water, and in a complex dynamic with the plants, chemical signals. So that's why I put the mushroom at the top with eager human hands reaching out to eat it or, or maybe learn from it. I wanted this piece to really burst with life. So I repeated the big psychedelic flowers I used in the gathering piece. And there are dozens of tiny insects hidden in the leaves. The baby birds just yelling at us to pay attention to this urgent situation. You can maybe see the little flies and another insect in amongst the leaves. I painted them on the back of the glass, so they're quite subtle and just kind of sneak up on you when you're looking really closely at it. There's a mouse down there on the bottom left and a, and a half hidden cat on the right, indulging in a life or death scenario. Plus some hanging Christmas decorations and a cross shaped piece of wood nailed roughly into the trunk, which makes a subtle reference to windmills or maybe crucifixions, the threads that link us to the past. Here are some greasy hands trying to beat that beetle to that slightly mouldy peach. There's a tiny sapling growing in the middle of the trunk, a symbol of regeneration and hope. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I like the chaotic accidentally cubist style of old windows that have been haphazardly repaired many times over the centuries. I like that fragmented thing. I've tried to get that with this piece, Two Witches, Knowledge is Power. 
Here, the subject is knowledge, or specifically access to education, particularly for girls. Knowledge is symbolized by a crow using a hooked tool, which humans can't use until the age of eight, and some pieces of computer code to the side. Freedom is symbolized by a key, and wisdom is a winking owl, which is defecating on a Freemasonry um, emblem. I was once asked to go and court for a job repairing the stained glass windows in a Freemason's lodge. They were obviously taken aback when I turned up, and they said I was the first woman who'd ever set foot in their historical building. Such secret societies are an attempt to exclude women and keep them ignorant. In 16th century Britain, women who educated themselves were often accused of witchcraft, hence the title of the piece. The flames also make a reference to witchcraft. The girl on the right is holding a torch which is attracting tiny moths, symbolising enlightenment through studying the natural world. The moths are sandblasted on blue glass and painted on both sides of the light beam. She's sharing ideas with her friend via a curly cable attached to an earpiece. She also has a flagpole with a condom flying from it, symbolising access to safe sex and contraception, major factors in the emancipation of women. I also thought it would be quite amusing to make the world's first stained glass condom. And I'm pleased to say that this piece was exhibited in Venice earlier this year, with no complaints from the Vatican. On her lapel, there's an image of a road to a stepped mountain, symbolizing ambition and independence. The girl on the left has a spanner, an electric guitar, and is writing the words, knowledge is power in seven of the world's most commonly used languages, Arabic, Portuguese, Russian, Hindi, Spanish, Chinese, and French. The tease is that many English speakers don't bother to learn other languages, so they won't understand the text on the scroll, thus emphasising the title of the work, Knowledge is Power. So finally, I'd just like to mention my latest project, which is an installation with stained glass, film and ambisonic sound. As I have such a, a lengthy background in sound and performance, I've wanted to combine this with stained glass for a long, long time. The ghosts that haunt me in my stained glass work will be the lead actors in this piece. This is an image from an early film still from the piece. The colours, the historical associations and the social implications of stained glass are so powerful. I wanted to create an immersive environment using imagery and sound, reaching out to people who might still think that stained glass is just a little old fashioned. So thank you so much for listening to this. I hope it's been interesting. Please feel free to ask me a few questions, but be gentle. Thank you so much, Pinky. Um, rounds of applause from all of our living rooms and offices. Uh, sorry that you don't hear that in real life uh, echoed around, but I'm sure that's what people are doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's extraordinary to see um, so many detailed images as well. Um, I have actually only seen your work on online, so through small digital images. So it's really, really delightful to have you uh talk us through um these pieces and also to show us so many details and bits that actually you would not see at all on social media um because they're too small so it's a, a real privilege for all of us so thank you thank you thank and you. poignant images for our times i think we can all agree some really important like global issues actually um have come up in in the subjects in your in your work um a very relevant contemporary artist you are um, I'm going to invite people to put questions in the chat uh, and or the, the Q&A. Uh, sorry again for the slight interruption, but I think Pinky did go over that bit again. So, um, But if you missed anything due to the technical issue, please do feel free to say now as well, because I'm sure Pinky would be happy to um, 
go back to a particular piece. Sure. Um, question from me. You did talk about one commission um, for the art gallery. And I wondered whether most of your works are conceived as autonomous exhibition pieces, whether that's just the way it's been or whether you prefer working that way. And talk, maybe talk a bit about the architectural sides of stained glass, which of course is what most people think of when they think of historical sure. glass. Um, well, it's really just a matter of cutting out the middle person, I suppose. I, 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 it, it's two very different things. I mean, you do lose something from, from um, installing stained glass in a light box, but you also gain a lot. Um, what you lose is the, the movement and the texture of the, the beautiful handmade glass. Um, so I would, I'd hate to completely give up doing architectural glass, but after years of doing that, I just found it, it lacked the spontaneity and, and I love this when I'm making a piece that nobody else is involved in. I just love that being able to just go with the flow and do spontaneous stuff and, and just make it up as I go along and not worry about what anybody else is thinking. Then you can just put it in a gallery and if somebody likes it, bingo, that's great. Whereas architectural work, it's always a commission and very often the, the person that commissions it has already has an idea of what they want. And that's, you know, that, that's quite a block in the creative process. So I do prefer to do pieces in light boxes. Fab. And apart from the conceptual piece that you alluded to at the end, are you working on any other conceptual light box pieces at the moment? Oh yeah, I'm constantly, constantly making stuff. Um, the, I'm working on a piece at the moment, which is about, well, you know, I work at it as I go along, but it's it's kind of about post-truth and words and our response to what, what we're being told and, and the way that in the past few years, it's become more and more confusing and harder and harder to try and work out what is actually true and what is not. So that's, yeah, that's what's going on at the moment. But it's always done with a, a wry humour, I think. So it's the one that I'm making at the moment is called Gut Reactions to Post Truth. So you can imagine what All that might be. I cannot wait to see it. And if um, Pinky does uh, post on her own social media uh, channel, so do follow Pinky if you don't already. Um, and you'll probably see that piece when it's finished. Okay, on the back of that then, Lucy asks, you mentioned being happy when your work is seen or displayed publicly. Does this motivate you, like getting the story of Porta Vadi out there? Oh, hugely, hugely. And, and I mean, in particular, that one, because that was, a, you know, a, a childhood trauma that as I got older, I realised it was only really our family and a handful of other people that knew about that. And then when, so when the National Museum of Scotland bought that piece, I thought, oh, wow, this is amazing. We can tell the world, I can tell the world that, that this has happened. And, and you know, the, it, it, it's not just being swept under the rug. It, and, and also it's so relevant to, to what's happening now with, with oil. You know, back in the 70s, for me then, it was just a personal shock at the destruction of a place. But of course, we know so much more now, and yet we're still under the control of these oil companies. So it's, it's from the National Museum of Scotland's point of view, it was very relevant to the exhibitions they're, that they're putting on now about climate change. So yeah, that was, that was huge for me. Um, Rachel asks, do you think that the beauty of stained glass allows you to talk about ugly things in a way other mediums don't allow you to? That's that's absolutely so brilliantly put, actually, Rachel. That's perfect. It is. It's because, I mean, it's almost, I almost feel like it's kind of sneaky, you know, because I can kind of lure people in with this beautiful glowing thing with all these amazing colours. And then I've got them, you know, and and... and instead of it just being something pretty they're forced to think about 
deep stuff. Yeah, it's that next level engagement that I think most people don't have at all when they go into a church to look at stained glass. Well, exactly. That's the thing. I mean, so much of it's alienating and also when it's huge, you can't really see what it is anyway, you know. That's I like the intimacy of, of doing smaller work. And how how big is the biggest piece you've made, just out of interest, when you, you how big are these pieces? Because we're seeing them on a screen. Um, the pieces that I've showed you today, they're about uh, a meter and a half tall by 90 centimeters wide that'd yeah. be about the biggest that gives people a bit of a, a sense mm. of the scale i think mm. um izzy asks can i ask if there are any particular stained glass artists who are the ghosts pinky imagines looking over her shoulder as she produces her art well i don't know their names sadly but um well, the ones that I showed you, the two that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, and Chart Cathedral, York Minster, there's just these little tiny ones that have got, or little funny little scenes from of people drying their socks and birds pecking at spiders and, and things like that that you just, I don't know, they're just, it just makes you realise that all that stuff was going on 500 years ago and it's just a little reminder of the sort of timelessness of it. Well one, one of our viewers has said you make me think of how medieval artists lampooned bishops and people in gargoyles or hidden carved things and I think it's that kind of uh, part of medieval art that you're alluding to here which is, is that yeah possible yeah I guess so I guess so I mean I, I mean I don't I'm not an expert in medieval art but um that yeah I'm sure that, that you know that it's the stuff that was hidden away and that uh surprises you you know you you kind of expect it people unfortunately just expect stained glass to be a bit dull you know and and a picture of a saint and or a picture of that they, you know, a, a version of a story that you've seen many, many times, and then all of a sudden you get this funny little odd thing, and you think, oh, "Hey, they're human after all. <laughs> they had, they were funny, they were dark, they were strange, just like we are." And um, FX coordinate says you mentioned medieval stained glass as an inspiration. Would you see the pieces you make as stories and yourself as a storyteller in the same way? That we think of medieval art as storytelling absolutely absolutely and i mean i hope i mean for me that's one of the greatest challenges because obviously i know the story and and it's it's being able to translate that into to stained glass is really challenging um and and that goes back to what i was saying about it being really slow and then you can kind of work it out as you go along i mean quite often i'll i'll you know create this image and not really be sure of what it's about. I, I rely on my sub, subconscious quite a lot. And then after a while I'll think, ah, oh, yeah, that's it, that's it. That's what's getting at you today. And, 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 and then I'll be able to put in lots of little symbols and, and other, other little details in amongst it. That, they're almost like clues in, in a puzzle that will lead the viewer into, in, Realizing what the story is all about. I don't. I don't want to be, you know, really kind of, um, what's the word? Uh, you know, preaching or. Uh, it's nice if it's, there's a bit of ambiguity there, but at the same time, you know, I, I'm I'm venting my spleen here. <laughs> you know, I, I I know what I want people to to think about, so I'm 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 trying to stimulate those ideas through the through the medium. Well, certainly, I felt like you were telling us stories this evening and I think that was that was conveyed in the way that hearing you speak about these pieces it, it was really fantastic and brought them Brilliant. to life um a couple more questions if you're happy pinky because people really engage yeah. tonight um, right. there's a couple of questions on techniques which I'll lump together and you can answer as you like some one of which is are all the pieces leaded uh, and no, they're not. They're not. They're, mo they're mostly not. I, I use lead for architectural work and copper foil for light boxes, simply because light boxes, you don't want them to be really heavy. 
and whereas with lead it's it gives it that solidity and the copper foil enables you to work on a smaller scale as well i assume yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and a, a technical question from me on, on the back of that which is more about the creative process actually because you mentioned the fragments of rescued glass or, or pieces mm -hmm. of the raw material that you'd found and then worked with and it made me wonder how much when you're planning a piece is it drawn out in detail as a cartoon and how much are you working from the glass sure. maybe one paper and backwards is it is it kind of um, a different approach to maybe making an architectural piece where you always start with the, the drawing yes it is it is it's, it's it's getting looser and looser actually and that that's been a deliberate choice i mean obviously i have i have the basic outline so that I know what what size it's going to be but it gets changed a lot as I go along and I, I really like <clears throat> the slight loss of control that you that using lots of odds and ends and scraps because also I've collected a big bucket of bits and pieces that didn't quite work out for various windows and I've kept them all and I'll, I'll sometimes just pick up a bit and put it in and and you know just add a line it's 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 quite random now does that answer that question <laughs> yeah yeah it does and i think um some of the the detailed painting as well in the small areas one gets a sense you couldn't really do that on a drawing as fine no. it, there's a sense it feels like you're you're kind of just working on the glass kind of with an immediacy yeah as, as you're yeah. Doing, obviously so it's, it's yes i prefer that but i've always i've always sort of been striving to, to get that a certain looseness in it mm. And, and I've, I've found that the, you know, like I said earlier, what I really love is is that slight mystery of those really sort of knackered, fragmented old windows. And and if I can try and get some of that into my work, then that, that makes me really happy because I think it just gives it that sort of slight mad edge that that stained glass, only stained glass has that. Or maybe, you know, we, I can't remember what's the name of the technique um, when, when you break pottery and put it back together again. And maybe it relates to that a bit. Uh, I've forgotten the name of that, but I think some people might know that. I know what you mean. And when you repair it with yeah. gold. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I've also forgotten the name. If you remember the name, <laughs> pop it in the chat and we'll remind everybody. Is it? It, it's like wasabi, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there there are still one or two more. I'll try try and get through them if you're happy, T Pinky. Um, sure. And because something that I didn't mention that I should have when I was introducing you that you're also a musician and a songwriter. Um, and Rachel wants to know a bit more about how your songwriting and visual art combine in terms of shape and rhythm she notices is that you create these tableaus of multi-layered storytelling is this Ooh. a bit like listening to a sound several times do they interlink or are they for you different uh they are well for a long time they didn't interlink as far as i knew in fact i gave up music for about five years just to focus on on stained glass but then i realized lately that I wanted to combine them because it felt like almost like I've been split into two people and and this and I grew up in the northeast of Scotland in a very rural area where there were folk songs sung in a dialect that most people in Britain have never even heard and one of the things that I I did with my, my band was was take those really old old songs and turn them into a sort of post rock or electronica and and you know just I love playing around with this old and new thing so so that kind of has has fed into the stained glass with the old and new and there's so much possibility there once you start researching into the past and. Um, so so yeah i think they are really interlinked i think i think that i'm probably trying to do the same thing but kind of the other way around with the music i'm i'm taking old songs and making them new and with stained glass i'm taking well maybe an old medium and and putting new content into that 
Does that answer the question? I don't know. That was a bit yeah, rambling. I think it does. I think it does. It's, an, it's a really good question. And um, I think when you look up your work, you know, you're you're as well known as a musician. And you were known as a musician before you, before kind of your your contemporary pieces were in, were in galleries, your stained glass. So it's, you're a multi-dimensional artist, multidisciplinary. I think you might have pulled... And uh, it was generally just Mr. Why? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you're back. Great. Oh, okay. yes. So we. But yes, yeah, so I really want. To, I really want to combine those two things now and bring them together into one concept. So that's my, that's where I'm going now. I hope. Well, let us know um, when it's when it's done and where we can go and see it. Um, everyone who attended this evening has just wanted to, us to thank you for a fantastic talk um, for your amazing work. I will thank send you. you all the nice comments that that we've received, and I'll finish with a. A uh, question or suggestion from Heather, he says, the explanations of your creations are amazing and cannot be imagined. Is there any documentation of your work with explanation, e.g. a book would be fantastic? There we go. Well, a book would be That's nice. <laughs> there, is no, there is not yet a book. There is not yet a book. I mean, there's quite a lot on my website. Um, I do try and go into some quite lengthy descriptions on my website. Great. Right. Um, well, head over to Pinky's website if you want to read read those descriptions. Um, and thank you for answering those questions, Pinky, and for giving us such great insight into your work and your creative process um, on a Wednesday evening. We really appreciate it. So just to much for, for listening, for inviting me. Thank you. Just to finish up. Um, we will share these slides just to remind you of what we have coming up um, at the museum. Uh, we have a couple more talks in the following weeks. Next Wednesday evening, um, we hear from Professor Vin Virginia Ragang um, about American opalescent artists. And then after half term in early November, um, we have uh, Lisbeth Langouche, who's a Belgian scholar, talking to us about pattern books um, from the 17th century for leaded panels. So thank you again for joining us tonight for our contemporary artist talk. And if any of those other talks um, appeal to you, do go to our website to book tickets. The link is below there. Um, thank you once again to Pinky and all of you for joining us. Have a good evening. If you haven't had supper yet, I hope you might enjoy the supper of gods that is fish and chips, or perhaps save that for Friday. Good night, everybody.